Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so the title of my talk today is Transforming Developers into Security People. And uh, so as Hillary said, my name is Chris Romeo from Security Journey. Uh, I'm actually based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, the way I got connected to Converge is I grew up in Saginaw, right up the road. And uh, when I saw there was a conference in Detroit a couple of years ago, I was like, this is a good chance for me to go back to Michigan. So I'm glad to be here. Um, the biggest Red Wing fan outside of the state of Michigan. That's my claim to fame. In case anybody in here is like a serious fan, I didn't want to, you know, start a brawl really early in my talk. We'll wait till a little later. Um, I've, been in, I've been doing security for a long time uh, since, I guess, I started doing security when it wasn't cool. It almost feels like it's kind of cool now and it's a little more, a little more hip than, uh, than it, it used to be. I spent 10 years of my time at Cisco as part of a central security team where I got a, a lot of different perspectives that kind of color what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and so let's go ahead and jump in. So from an agenda perspective, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit first about this idea that security should matter to the developers that exist in your organization. And then we'll explore a little bit about why is security a stretch for them today? What, why is it a struggle? Why isn't every developer writing secure code right now as they sit back in, in your company's writing code? Uh, then we'll explore a couple of different responses that I found to security from different developer populations. And then I'll introduce this idea that I call security behaviors. So uh, I love to start talks with this slide because this is a uh, famous philosopher of Silicon Valley said this going on six or seven years ago now. And that is, he said, software is eating the world. And uh, does anybody remember who it is? Somebody yell it out. Really rich guy, started Netscape. Mark Andreessen has a, a large, I guess, a large venture fund at this point. But uh, it's just a, it's a really pithy way to think about what's going on in the world of technology these days. Software is in everything that we own, from refrigerators to cars to computers, phones, all the other things that, are, that are, we normally think about. And so that just raises the stakes from an application security perspective to such a higher level. When you have software everywhere, that software has to be, has to be written better and with better security properties. And so when we start to think about developers, Let's think a little bit about the mindset of the average developer. And so I put that in quotes, average developer, because whenever I share this example, I always have somebody who raises their hand and say, oh, no, no, I know this developer. And he or she is all into security. They love it. They breathe, eat it, sleep, whatever. Um, and so let's talk about the average developer, meaning this isn't the person who is just gung-ho and really passionate about security, but this is a representative sample of an entire development organization. And so developers historically are, there's a couple different things that we push them towards. We say, well, we want you to create bug-free code. We want it to, to get to us on time. It should be complete, and it has to be on budget. And the incentive historically that we've had for developers is you got to ship code, you have to release, and that's the most important thing. And so this is the mindset that the average developer is coming to security and the kind of the, the lenses that they're looking through. I don't know this guy, Alexei Shipilev, but I just I saw this tweet and I just thought it was it was a great way to describe this whole software's eating the world problem. When software's eating the world, it becomes your social responsibility to write correct, maintainable, and understandable code. I wish he would have put comma secure and understandable code when he tweeted it out. I could probably like work it in or something, um, but but I think that's I think correct, maintainable, understandable. Those are all things that support security. They support better code and, and better approaches to to what we're trying to do. So I've heard lots of different excuses in my 20 year career for why we can't do security, but here's three of the big ones that I that I've heard a lot of times from tech companies, but also from other types of industries as well. The first one is. 
we can't do security because it's too slow. You're going to slow us down. We can't, we can't keep up. We, we operate at a, at a fast pace here, and you're just trying to slow us down. The second thing that I hear is, well, we do waterfall, or we do agile, or we do DevOps, or we do something else, and that doesn't support security. Also a false statement. Um, security can be added to any methodology. It's, it's independent of the methodology. And the last thing is, we have this, people have this perspective of those of us in security that we're the department of no. They think, you know, if I was to go and actually talk to those, the, the, the folks over there in security, they're probably going to tell me no, and I can't do what, what I really want to do here, this new cool feature and idea, so we're, I'm just going to kind of forget to tell them about it. And so that's where we, as an industry, we need to become the department of no, comma, but. Here's how we can make it more secure, make it better. So here, these are just some high-level objections that I've heard over time. We'll dive deeper into these. Uh, here's another one that I've heard. We already have a security department. And, and that security department are the people who are responsible for security. And so I found this interest, interesting statistic from the, the good folks uh, in the BSIM organization. And what they found, BSIM measures the, the, how good software security programs are across, I think they've got like 97 members right now from every different industry, big companies, medium-sized companies. And so these are people who take security seriously. They found across all of their member companies, for every 100 developers, they averaged 1.61 security people. And so that tells us right there that we're never, even in companies that are super serious about software security, they don't have, you just don't have the staff. You're not going to build out a team of one security person for every two developers that exist out there. And so we've got to approach this problem from a different perspective. So security is a stretch for most developers. Uh, I find that they just, they just, a lot of times they don't understand. They're just not even aware of what the issues are that they need to deal with. And we're going to work through those a little bit here. Um, I find security IQ is low. I think of security IQ is just how much, how much knowledge, intelligence does a person, does a develop, developer have in regards to how to create secure code. The developers are really the first line of defense. If you think about all the protection and all the things that you try to do, if you build applications, once you deploy that application, you can do things to protect it and monitor and watch it. But if you can do things, the developers can do things earlier on in the process, it's just that much better for the overall strength of the application and the overall system that you're deploying. So one thing we have to remember here is developers are not monsters. Okay? They're not sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to show the security department. Watch this. I'm going to put a SQL injection vulnerability in here. Ha, take that. Right? They're not, they're, it's not like they're malicious. Sure, is there 0.01% or maybe 1%, I don't know, depending on where you are, malicious people that are going to exist out there in the developer community? Sure. Okay? But most people are not making decisions to say, I'm going to make this thing break. It's, they, they don't know what the right thing is. And granted, developers can sometimes be stubborn, okay? I'll admit that here. They can sometimes be, it can sometimes take a while to bring them along and get them to understand new ideas or new concepts. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, they're, they're, should be opposed to what we're doing in the world of security. So when I work with an organization, my goal is I want to end up with developers that think like security people. Okay, a lot of people in the industry will say, well, you've got to get to the point where your developers can think like hackers. Okay? No. And I don't have any problem with the term hacker. I just don't think that I'm going to be able to equip all of my developers with that level of knowledge, experience, and ability to break stuff that you would expect from somebody who you would label as a hacker. But I think we can teach them the things of the security person. We can teach what risk is, what threats are. So at least they have these ideas floating around in their head when they're faced with a decision. And so that's the idea of this, the light bulb going on. I've, I've seen that happen in different um, projects I've worked on in the past where we're taking a team through how to do threat modeling. And somebody will be going through, they'll be creating their diagram and, and figuring out a threat, and all of a sudden you'll see their eyes will light up, and they just get it. They're just like... Oh, wait a minute, that's my application, and I see the problem that exists now. That's what I just define as the security light bulb, when that, that aha moment that, ooh, wow, this is something that really does exist in my applications. 
So if we're going to embed this security person mindset, what does that look like? Well, I define this as, as really four different things that I want to embed within every developer that is writing code on a project that I'm a part of. The first thing is this idea of foundational knowledge. There's some basic things about security we want them to, to know. I talked a minute ago about threats and risks. Developers should at least have a definition of, of threat, risk, vulnerability, exploit, zero day. Give them that basic knowledge, that basic understanding, uh, so that when they, when they experience these things, they have a, some perspective. It's not just coming out of the blue, like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Second thing that makes, that makes up this mindset is understanding attacks. So if, there, if you have a web application programmer and they've never heard of the OWASP top 10, your program has a problem. Okay? They, they, your, what your web app programmer should have an appreciation for at least the OWASP top 1 injection, um, if maybe not all 10, um, at least they should have some perspective on the one. If, if you're programming in C and they don't know what buffer overflows are or they don't know what unsafe functions are, then we've got a problem. They need to understand the attacks. The other thing that does is that really, for some people, that really, that's where you get them is where they, they have that aha moment when they actually do perform a SQL injection attack and are able to dump a database table into the browser window. When they see that happen, they're like, oh, okay, now, now I have that understanding, that appreciation. Third piece of this is acknowledging attacks. Uh, the developers have to actively say, my code that gets deployed on our web servers is going to be attacked the moment it's out there. I, fi I still find some people that have a perspective of, eh, what I'm my feature is just not that interesting. Yeah, everybody's feature is that interesting if it has a public interface and it's on part of a web server. Last piece of this is utilizing tools and processes. So we have tools that can make this easier. We can create processes. We want them to have an understanding of what those, what those security tools and processes actually look like, what do you do with them, and you know, how, do you, how are you successful with, with using those to move your program forward. So I borrowed this next idea and, and to, to think about how we reach developers. A um, guy named Simon Sinek wrote this book, Start With Why. It has nothing to do with technology. Um, I don't even know what section of the bookstore or you would find it in or on Amazon. Um, but I, I thought it was a really interesting approach, an interesting way to think about how we usually do this wrong when we try to teach somebody something. Normally what we do, so imagine if we were going to come in and start working with a bunch of developers. Usually the first thing we would do is we would say, okay, here is the secure development lifecycle that we have. Here's our big old process. Welcome to 100 pages of documentation. We drop them on the desk and say, if you could just read that and, and prepare to do something with it. Then we may give them some other type of documentation, implementation guides that say, okay, here's how you do this SDL thing, secure development lifecycle. Here's how you run the tools. Here's how you get the output. And only if we're lucky at the end of this process, do we get to the point where we try to explain to them why they would even care about all the things we've been talking about? And so Simon Sinek, he didn't create this idea from a security perspective. It, it was just an, a, a kind of a general theory or, or practice. But I'm, I'm saying we can do this with developers by starting with why. Start with why they need to care about all the things that you're going to ask them to do. And then you can start to layer the what's and the how's on top of it after you explain the application that you are working on stores a database filled with personal information, personal identifiable information of millions of our customers. And if that data was to be uh, breached, we might go out of business. That might be the end of, of us as a company. If they understand that why before we start talking about tools and processes and all this work they have to do, it's just it's a different mindset. It's a different way to think about it or approach it. So when I think about influencing security culture in an organization, uh, I think there's, there's just like every, almost everything, you can attach a bell curve to kind of the perspective of, of how you're going to influence a security culture you know, for, within a, bunch of, uh, a group of developers, whether it's the entire organization. But really, if you start on the left and work your way across this picture, um, you already have some security people that just love security. They live for it, and they're going to do whatever they can to make the security uh, program better in your organization. Then you have some security interested people. These are people on the fringe. They're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'd like to learn more. Try and, you know, can you enable me, provide me with more information or, or lessons that I can learn? Um, and then as, as you get to that early majority, now you're starting to build some momentum within your organization where people are starting to 
hear a lot more about security. Executives are starting to talk about it, and it's just starting to, starting to really catch hold and kind of take on a, a life of its own almost. There's all, and then that last one, the, or the, the yellow one there, the forced compliance, there's always going to be some people who say, uh, I'm not going to do it unless you make me do it. And that's the, the group that happens there. And then there's that red triangle, depending in your organization, that may be bigger or smaller of the, I'm probably, they're just not going to do whatever you tell them to do. So I was at Cisco for 10 years. That red triangle at Cisco is probably bigger than the average triangle of, of everybody else in the room. Just Cisco had a culture where people in engineering could say, no, we're not doing that, and they could get away with it. So, uh, so to kind of summarize this, this section where we're going through here, that we just come through here, application security, this is a people problem. Okay? The developers are the key. They're the key people that I see that are part of this, this challenge that we can really enable and get them ready to be part of this solution. Tool vendors, they, they tend to disagree with me on this point. They think that application security is about the tools, about the technologies. And I, don't, I don't dislike tools and technologies, but I think you have to really prepare the people to be able to use them. And that's where the developers can come in. Okay, so I did some research as I was preparing this talk, and so I thought back across some of the different organizations that I've had a chance to, to work with. I talked about Cisco. Um, in my, my work with Security Journey, I've had a chance to look inside of uh, startup companies, me, medium-sized tech companies, just a, a lot of different, you know, some financials, a different cross-section of the world. And I also asked a number of my friends from different industries, what are the reasons that you hear from developers as to why they can't do security? And we ended up being able to categorize these into four different buckets. The, those that are unfamiliar, those that are overworked, those that are apathetic, and then the gung-ho. So the first group here is this unfamiliar, uneducated, um, and they, these are, some of these are actual quotes, like that first one was actually a quote somebody forwarded to me from, uh, from their company, where somebody had just that week sent them this, sent this message, or that line, why like, that's why I wouldn't write like that if I was making an example. Why like legit, why do we need to do security? He had, he had received that in his email and just forwarded that little snippet and said, here you go, here's, what, here's an example of what you asked me about. Um, other times people say, I just don't understand, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, number three is dangerous. We're little, no one would go after us. Well, not necessarily true. And then four kind of pains me just a little bit, but security causes change and change is too risky for our apps. Like, wow, if, that's, if your app is that fragile, you probably got other, other issues as well. So what do we do then with those who are unfamiliar, the uneducated, that first group there? Well, I think the first thing we do is we, do, we need to provide them some foundational lessons. These are the things that are going to allow them to kind of understand what we're talking about. Security fundamentals. This is the idea of what are those basic vocabulary words mean. Attacks and attackers. What are the, and, and I'm talking at this point, I'm talking super high level. Like, what are the, um, what are the, the web-based application attacks that OWASP top 10 models? What is a buffer overflow? What is a distributed denial of service? And then also, who are the people that are trying to attack you? If you have a process for secure development lifecycle, we want to we want to prepare people to understand that. Uh, privacy, customer data protection is a huge thing for almost. I haven't found a business that doesn't see that as a huge problem uh, in this day and age. So everybody's concerned with that. And there's also this idea of a security business case, or what's the return on investment that we're going to have. But the idea here is let's let's provide some foundational lessons that allow that person who just doesn't get what. Uh, what they're supposed to be doing to really connect with them and help them to understand. And then this, the, the second action that comes from the, this group is everyone's a security person. I want to build a culture in any organization that I work with where everyone feels like they're a security person and they're part of the overall solution. From developers, testers, product managers, program managers, all the way up into the executive suite, everybody in that building should know what their piece of the security solution is. And everyone's is going to be different. Developers is going to be a lot different than what a VP of marketing or engineering is going to have to do. But you want to have a culture where everyone feels like, yes, I am responsible for security in my job, in what I do. And so that, that really uh, kind of helps to, to build that type of a culture. Second one here, the, uh, the overworked group. 
And this has been the most popular one that I found in, in my uh, requests about this. Um, this is the, the people that are saying, I got too much other work to do. Um, security is an unfunded mandate. That's actually a live statement that I got from somebody directly. Um, we don't have time to build in security. So this is the idea that, you know, developers are busy people. There are, we are, I, I will agree 100%. Developers are overworked, they have too much to do, and they're under a lot of pressure. But there are some things that we can do to help alleviate the concerns of the overworked. The first thing we need to do is we need to automate anything that we can in an application security program. Okay? So um, you may develop from a waterfall perspective. You may be in, this, in the kind of agile. Um, you may have moved to full-on DevOps where a lot of things are already automated. But... The idea here is developers hate to waste time. Time is a premium for them. Uh, developers do not do well with things like false positives. So we have to look for opportunities to automate as best as possible, and we have to make sure we minimize false positives that exist there. And in some cases, that means that when you get a new tool that's going to scan your code, it's going to help the developers, you're looking at it like this is going to be the best thing in the world. The one thing that those tools are known for in the beginning is false positive rates. And so I actually advise people, tune that thing down. Pick one thing, one type of problem that you want to find in the beginning, and turn off everything else in the static an analysis tool, and, and, and so that you want to minimize any of the false positives that happen there. The other thing that we can do from a, for, for developers is we want to simplify. Okay, don't come to them with a 29-step with a process for what they have to do to run static analysis or threat model or anything like that. You have to think about how can we simplify and make, this, make these things we're asking them to do be the least amount of, of complicated as possible. And then the, the, the other part of um, dealing with the overworked is there's a, there is a, a need for management executive education. Um, in my career, I've always been a bottoms-up type of approach to get, making anything happen, meaning I'll try to get all the people on the ground floor with me kind of on board, and we'll start moving in a direction. And then the executives will look and say, oh, well, something's happening. And then eventually they'll have to say, oh, either say that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. Hopefully what I'm driving is a good thing. But I think there's a need for both a, a bottoms-up and a top-down approach here. There's some education that can happen so that executives know. And executives don't, they're, they're not really going to care about vulnerabilities, per se. In my experience, they're going to care about risk. What is the risk to our organization if we don't do this, if we don't invest in these things, if we don't take on these ideas of everyone's a security person? And so there's some different levels of discussion that happen there, but overall education is a good way to approach that. Okay, the third response, these, this is the apathetic, complacent. This is the, um, I just don't care. The developer is like, I just don't care about security. It's too hard, sounds really complicated, not my problem. Nothing worth, worth protecting, I already know all this stuff. That's probably the most dangerous of all of them, number five. I already know all this stuff. Um, but this is, this is going to be the, the most difficult group to connect with here because they're, they're actually not only, they're, they're going to be, some of them are going to be opposed to what you're trying to do. And they're going to say, well, I'm just not going to do that because um, I don't want to. So there's um, a, a two different ways that we can approach this group. Um, one that I've had some success with in the past is what I like to call shock value. Does anybody recognize the... the uh, kind of the statistics on this slide as far as what, uh, it's from something popular the last couple of years. Which one? Wiki, did you say WikiLeaks? Yeah, it's from the it's Panama Papers. Yeah, yeah. So this is, so the, the, the law firm there, Mossack Fonseca, this is, the, this is the sum total of everything that they lost in that process. It doesn't include the number of customers they lost, which was a lot. Um, but look at that, 11.5 million documents, uh, information on 215,000 offshore entity companies. This, was, this, this Panama Papers thing resulted in a couple of pro, um, politicians in England and Ireland that were, in, their information was embedded here, actually losing their office. They actually got ousted from office as a result of this, um, as well as a lot of data. So if I'm working with a law firm and they're saying, hey, um, you know, we just don't care about security, this is the type of example that you might be able to shock somebody into saying, Wow, there's something real here. And everybody, every industry will be different. You know, a popular one I've been using in tech companies now has been the Yahoo breach of somewhere between 500 million and a billion um, 
you know, user IDs, passwords, user questions. Uh, that's just been a good one. And um, I guess the, the scary thing about the security industry is there's always seems to be another one, another example that we'll be able to use in six months or whatever that'll be even bigger than the ones that existed now. But shock value is about throwing an example out there and trying to, trying to mix it up a little bit. Now, this one pains me as someone, <laughs> if you look at the title, I don't know if I can even say it out loud, but I probably will have to. Um, this, is, this is about uh, compliance. So when you're dealing with those people that just don't care, they just, they're just pushing back, they don't want to, they don't want to deal with it, um, you may just have to say, you know what, we're making requirements, we're making laws, rules, standards, whatever we want to call them, that say that we're going to have to do, you're going to have to do these things as part of working here. Um, I'd love to, to live in a, a world or work in a company where that wasn't necessary because everybody was already so on board with it, but you know, depending on the size of your company, you, you're going to have some people who you're going to have to mandate this stuff for. And then the fourth response, this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is actually the fun one. This, these are the people that, that love security, and there, there is a population of them out there. Uh, these are the people that are gung-ho, they're saying, what can we learn about security, or where can we learn more? Where can I get a mentor to help me? I could see myself transitioning into a full-time job in the world of security. So these are the, these are the ones that are fun and make, make working in the, in the field of security culture and culture change something that's uh, enjoyable to do. Really, one primary action for engaging these folks, and that is to create some type of a community in your organization where you can capture that, those people that are really passionate about security and are saying, let's, let's do something here. Um, it may be a security, uh, you'll see it named many different things, security advocate, guild, champion, they're all doing the same thing. It's all about how do we bring people together and get them fired up and give them opportunities to learn, network, and experience security so that they grow in their abilities. Uh, you can do this with monthly training sessions. At Cisco, I used to host a monthly training session that had about 500 people on it, virtual, it was a virtual conference type of thing. Um, I'd reach out to different people in the industry. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people, how many people that speak at conferences all the time will dial into a 30-minute uh, web conference and, and do a presentation for your group. Uh, now, if you ask them to jump on an airplane and come to your offices, that's a little bit, little bit more difficult. But a 30-minute call, most people will make that happen just, just to benefit the community and, and whatever else might come out of it. Uh, capture the flags, like just similar to what's going on now at this conference at Converge. You can do that in your own company and, and have those types of things going. Uh, if you get mature enough, you can even do your own security conferences like Converge inside of your company. So that's how you, how you harness the, uh, the gung-ho folks. Um, so I'm curious now, I like to, to pull the room and kind of see, I have a sneaking suspicion as to which of these groups is going to have the most hands go up. But from the developers that you work with in your organization, um, how, how, many, how many people would say that the most common response you would hear from your organization's developers would be that they're unfamiliar with security? Okay, a couple. Um, how about gung-ho? Okay. How about apathetic? Okay. And how about overworked? Yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose. I kind of figured overworked was going to be the most one. That's, and that, that's consistent with what I've seen in other audiences as well. So that, that tells me that that's our primary focus point in anything that we're trying to do from a culture change perspective is those are the people we have to, to, to focus our, our eyes on and really work to help first. So one of the things that, that, that I've found that you can do uh, when trying to help developers, we talked about simplicity, but how do we make this security thing more simple? Instead of just throwing them a 100-page process document, what, what else could we do? And so I like to use this idea of a security behavior. And I define this as uh, security behavior is a manner of behaving that decreases danger, risk, or threat. So these are things, these are, these are things that we want to encourage developers to do. And here's some of the properties that, that of what defines a security behavior. First, it's got to be lightweight. Okay? You cannot tell me that it's 124 steps to be done. It's got to be lightweight, easy to grasp, uh, has to be well defined, has to have a clear start and finish point. So not one of those tasks, well, it'll be done when I say it's done. No, I mean, where, where does it start? Where does it end? How do we get in and out of it? 
Uh, back to that why. Why and what's the return on investment? And the last one is easily repeatable. So this is about how do we package up the things that we're asking developers to do into this framework of security behaviors. So what is the security behavior not? First, it's not a process. Okay? It sounds suspiciously like a process, but it's not designed to, to be a process. It's not, in, not intended to be the entire secure development lifecycle that your company follows as well. That's too much to deal with in your head at one time. We have to simplify, squeeze these things down into something smaller. And so th this is the ultimate goal that we have with when working with security behaviors. Security behaviors is something that we want to keep trying to get the developers to repeat over and over again with the goal that eventually, if, they, if you do those security behaviors enough, your mindset changes, your skill set increases, and those security behaviors transition into security habits. Meaning, a security habit is something that you just do because you just know that's the right thing to do. That's what we're trying to do in this, this type of culture shift. If we get to the point where developers have embedded security habits into their thinking, then you're, you've become a very mature organization. And so I've got a couple, I've got about six or seven examples of different behaviors that can become habits that you can encourage through your developers. Um, the first one I think is, is just learning. Um, we talked about the fundamentals, why everybody needs to understand those. Um, and so this is, so from a learning perspective, this is the, the, uh, the opportunity for you to provide those basic lessons to your development staff and kind of breed this culture of constant learning and constantly growing your skill sets through knowledge acquisition. Because, you know, security is, it, it's, I think it's a great place to work because things are changing, I think, faster than almost any other field that I can think of. Um, there's always new stuff out there, and if you take a couple of years off, you're, you're lost in, the, in, the, uh, in the, the field. So you really have to stick with it. Okay, the second behavior is what I like to refer to as experience. Okay, this is experience-based learning. A couple of different tools that I share up here. Um, code bashing, Secure Code Warrior, and then OWASP WebGoat. Okay, I don't work for any of these companies. I don't get any. Um, I just happen to be fans of what these individual companies are doing. What they do is they provide your developers with an experience where they can actually learn by coding. They can actually code, and they have a learning environment where they'll have a piece of code, they'll have another window, similar to like you would do if you're in Code Academy, learning how to code. Except at this point, they have the code, it's broken, and they have an executed, a version of it executing in the next window, and they can go through and fix it and rerun it until they, until they eliminate the vulnerability that exists. Um, so Code Batch and Secure Code Warrior are both commercial companies that do that. OWASP WebGoat is... Um, it is a vulnerable web application that lets you exercise the OWASP top 10 problems. Um, so it's a great way, it's a great low budget, or not quite zero, because you have to spend some time setting it up, but it's a great low budget way to get into this experience-based learning. Third one, I talked about community quite extensively already. Um, it's really the, the value of the network uh, so, so breeding this behavior of community is the idea where the security people, they, they have a desire to be part of this group. And they, they see the benefits and the value of becoming part of this security community organization that you create. The community that I had at, at Cisco, uh, by the time I left Cisco, we'd reached the point where people were... When, I, when we first started it up, we had to go chase people down and, and kind of twist arms to get people to join up and be part of it. We got to the end, when, right to the, the time that I left Cisco, we had people that were trying to join. They were, they were, sending, they were calling and sending emails saying, hey, I want to get in. So it became like an exclusive kind of a, a thing for, um, for security inside of the company. Uh, so another behavior from the manager side that helps to cure some of those overworked problems is the idea of the resource planning exercise. Uh, we know that security takes time. It's, you're not going to be able to do something applying security principles. It's not going to make things go faster. It's just a fact of life. It's going to, you're going to add some additional work, some additional rework and thought processes and things that are going to cause you to have to, to do more. So we have to get to the point where managers understand that. And I think that is, in my experience, that is the biggest challenge to that overworked problem is that the managers, a lot of times I'll see developers and I'll hear them and they'll say, 
I get it. I, I want to do something with security, but I'm not getting the time. My manager's not giving me the time. So this behavior is about preparing the managers to understand um, what is the value of having somebody focus on security to, to deal with some of these problems to some, with some amount of their time. Threat modeling, uh, Matt Clapham did a, a, a great talk on threat modeling 101 a couple hours ago um, here at Converge. Uh, this is the idea where we want to find security problems in, a, in the design before we start writing code if we can. If we already have code, we can, we can work around it. But uh, when we have a new feature, if we can sketch it out on paper and think about all the different ways it could be attacked and then try to eliminate some of those before we start coding, things are just going to be better. Uh, threat modeling is one of the ones that I really think has a lot of potential to go from a security behavior into a security habit. I think of threat modeling as it should be just a temporary security activity uh, that has to be documented within your development organization. If, you tr if, your, if your organization truly gets to the point where threat modeling is a security habit, they're doing it themselves. As they're writing their design or they're in the whiteboard working and drawing up a new feature, they're going to start attacking it without even thinking about it. And so that's a, that's a great place where behavior can cross over into habit. Uh, code review is, um, so a lot of people do code review. Um, this behavior is how do we turn this into a security code review? And uh, the tools that are out there, the static analysis tools, they're great, but they're not perfect. They're, they're tools that are looking for problems. They're not going to find everything. They're terrible at finding design problems in code or finding places where something like authentication is missing on a, on a web service. Okay? Sure, you can have dynamic analysis tools that will help to do that maybe, but, um, but a, a human code review is still something of value from my perspective. Um, I just think you're going to end up with better code and less overall rework into the future if you can teach some amount of uh, security into the code review process so that, so that your developers know what to look for. If they're a web app developer, they know when they see SQL uh, being processed that they should look for whether the input is being taken directly from the parameter that's put in through the browser or if, it's being, if, if the framework is cleaning it up as it goes. Those are the type of, of things, capabilities that I want to see developers get to. Uh, second to last of the behaviors here is red teaming. So this is the idea of uh, being mean to your code. Developer, and and I, I didn't come up with that. I took that from the folks, the rugged DevOps group folks that have been talking about kind of software security improvements for a number of years. Um, but this is the idea where the developer should be thinking about how to attack their code all the time. They should be thinking about how they could attack it or how somebody that's outside of kind of the trusted enclave that they, that they, where they have access could also attack that, that um, product. And this is, so this is penetration testing for the developer. So once again, I'm a realist. I know we're not going to get to the point where all developers are super uber penetration testers that can just knock over everything in sight. But that's okay. We don't need them to get there. We can have penetration testers that do a lot of the heavy lifting. But the idea is how do we, how do we share some of that load to the developers? Because, you know, I've, developers are the ones that truly know the system better than... You know, even after a penetration tester spends a week, two weeks, um, you can still get together a group of developers, and they, they know the ins and outs of how everything works in the entire application. So what better place to kind of instill that idea of look for the places where things could break down? And the final one is just on the response side. So um, this is the idea of the security behavior. Let's, let's be prepared with an understanding of what happens when somebody reports a problem in our application. Whether it's a web application, whether it's desktop software that's going out, uh, somebody finds a problem in it, how, what, what's the developer supposed to do? Besides just put their hands up and say, that's not my problem, it's not my job. Let's prepare them for how they can respond to this security problem. What's, what, are the, what are the steps they're supposed to do? What's the timelines? Let's, let's get everybody up to speed in advance with that security behavior. And so this, um, this picture just kind of summarizes everything that I've talked about here from the four basic responses that we heard, the different transformations that I think that kind of sums up, you know, what, what, what we're trying to do from a, to, to convert somebody that's maybe unfamiliar, we're trying to feed them with knowledge. 
Uh, and then there's a, a list of behaviors that can be mixed, mixed and matched across the different, um, different types of responses to reach that group of people. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, apply what you've learned today. So if you, so if you were going to try and take what I talked about and go and do something with it, here's, here's what I would recommend. So I think the first thing you've got to do is you have to get an under, a true understanding for your organization's security culture. Okay? How is... It, how, how, how good are people when it comes to security, realistically? And so, I mean, that's, that's just something that, uh, that you have to assess yourself. Um, you can survey the developer populations. Um, you can talk to different people. Um, one of the tricks that I like to do, a lot of times I'll come into a company from outside, so I'm kind of an outside consultant. Um, and so I'll sit with a, a bunch of people from the security department that are, you know, focused on developers and security, and they'll kind of start telling me all this stuff. We're doing all this cool stuff and these great things. And then I'm like, I'll listen to that for a while. And then I'll be like, uh, can I go get a drink of water? And they're always like, sure, yeah, that's no problem. Go ahead. So then I go to the, to the, the kitchen or whatever, get a drink of water. And then the first person I turn around and see, I go, hey, what do you do here? Oh, you're a developer. Oh, let me ask you a couple of questions. And then I kind of try to balance that between what the official message was and what might actually be happening in the wild in, inside of that company. Um, so if you're going to try to do something with this in the first three months, so, so don't try to do all these things at once is the, the big takeaway here. Take, pick some of those security behaviors, maybe one. Um, so one is a good way to start, and try to figure out how you can embed that within your culture and get your developers on board with that one idea. Um, try to get some early successes here, and that'll make it easier if you want to come back and add things on top of it. And then, in, you know, maybe at six months, you can add the top three security behaviors that you want to focus on. Maybe within a year, you can roll them all out. Uh, but the idea is, is how do you, you know, how do you make these and take these into more bite-sized chunks and make it easier? Um, so just a really quick summary. Uh, we talked about application security is a stretch for the average developer that's out there. Um, we talked about a number of different excuses. The, the, the big takeaway there is everyone has an excuse. Uh, we just have to figure out how we can uh, prepare them so that excuse is not a, doesn't continue as a problem. And true security culture change, this is, uh, this is a behavior thing from my perspective. After studying this problem for 20 years, this is a, this is a people problem. It's not a technology problem. It's not even a process problem. It's, it's getting the people to understand the process and the technology that really causes a, uh, a big change in a security culture. And with that, I think we can take like two questions and then get you guys to the front of the happy hour line. Yes, sir. I think they don't want, a lot of times people don't want to show their dirty laundry off. They're thinking that they can, um, but I, I'm, I'm with you as far as my, the perfect pen test that I would recommend to people is don't, I mean, don't try to, to hide all these things and make it harder so that you have to spend hours trying to jump through hoops to then get to the stuff that you're ready to attack. Um, let's focus you in and get the best return on the investment. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure why, why people, I, my, my suspicion is that they're hoping that you're not going to find anything, and, and, but, but as a realist, we all know, we know that they're, yeah, I mean, you might, is, it a, you know, is it a compliance issue as well? Like, we do, well, we just have to have our pen test for the year, you know, it doesn't matter what actually the results are, I've seen that way too many times where, 
Um, then you go back the next year, and there's the same problems <laughs> that we found. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Yeah, and that's that, that's an organization that needs a security culture overhaul because. That, that type of a report should generate a finding that then causes people to go say, we got to look at everything else because that problem's here. It could exist in these other 20 different places throughout the infrastructure. So, yeah, totally agree with you. Uh, I think there's a question over here. Yes? So there's certainly a learning experience that has to happen there. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, to, to have a develop, developers that are going to participate in the red teaming perspective. And by that, I don't mean, I just mean that they're going to attack their code. It's not necessarily going to be a formal, okay, this week we're doing official pen test and these developers here over here. I want this to be embedded in, in, in the the ideas that, that they're working towards. But you're going to have to prepare them. You're going to have to, to invest in teaching them some of those methods and things. But like you said, the developers are the closest to the code. And so if they can find any, anything they find early in their development process that doesn't make it through to a release, I mean, that's just that's gold right there from an from a overall program perspective. Oh, I'm going to go here, right here. Okay, I like those questions. Okay. Okay, so um, would you call SQL injection something like SQL injection would be obvious? Okay, so I mean, how, what's the number one cause of data breach these days? SQL injection. So um, the, the idea, so threat modeling is never going to be perfect. I tell people that if you're expecting perfection, you're in the wrong business here. You are going to miss as many things as you see. But every one of those things you see and catch is going to eliminate something that gets pushed down the line further. So it's by, it's by no means a perf perfect science. It's not a science. I shouldn't even call it a science. It is based on the experience of the person doing the threat modeling. But you can certainly bring a lot of people along in that community approach and teach them more. And the more they see, the better they get. And security improves. It might not be as perfect as we want it to be. But I think there's a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think QA, I mean, I was focusing on developers for this conversation, but QA should be right alongside the developers in that red teaming perspective. I like to get QA folks involved in threat modeling as well, just because they're not doing the design. Sometimes, I mean, I suffer from this. Sometimes I'm creating some design, and I'm like, this is the best thing in the world. I'm, I can't see the, the gigantic flaw that exists. So I, I like to bring QA people into that threat modeling process, into the red teaming process, and I, I think they're valuable because they just have a different perspective. Um, they know how to break the system. They have some, a lot of them have that breaking mindset to begin with because they're trying to break, functionally they're trying to break. They can transition into the breaking on behalf of security and be really good at it. So yeah, I think that's a great way to approach it. All right, thank you very much, everybody.